Good afternoon. Warm greetings to everyone in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wishing one and all a very blessed New Year. Welcome to our first Church Bible study on a new theme, The Eyes of the Lord. Ten passages from God's Word where the phrase, The Eyes of the Lord, have been chosen for study throughout this year. And this afternoon, our first Passage will be taken from Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 8, and the title is The Eyes of the Lord in Salvation. Before we continue, let us seek the Lord's blessing. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this new year that you have given to us. We lean upon you. We trust in you. That whatever lies ahead in this new year, we know that thou art in total, absolute, sovereign control and nothing happens by chance. And we thank thee, Father, for seeing us through the year 2021, even though it was a very turbulent year, but you have taught us and many of us have experienced it. All things work together for good to those who love you, to those who are the called according to thy purpose. Teach us to focus on our love for thee and to know that we are left behind and called to be a blessing to others and to bring glory and honour to thy holy name. We pray, Father, that as we commence our church Bible study on the first day of the new year, we pray for thy Holy Spirit to instruct us, to teach us, to grant us illumination and understanding, that the word of God will strengthen our faith and also help us to focus on eternity and to know how great thou art, 
and how gracious and merciful Thou have always been to this sinful world. Forgive us, O Lord, of all our sins and bless our time together, O God. For Jesus' sake, we plead before Thy throne of grace and mercies. For this we ask with much thanksgiving in the most blessed and holy name of our great High Priest, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please allow me to read to you from Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 8. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And God said, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and sacred word. When you read the introduction of the notes, you may ask yourself, it doesn't seem to link to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 8 at all. It is a description of our world rather than the world of Noah. The reason why it is done this way is because what we read in Genesis 6 was the precursor to the global destruction of Noah's world by water. The world was in very, very great sin. And if you notice during the reading what God said, about the world of Noah's time in the last part of verse 5. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The world of Noah was sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. The people were so filled with sin that sin became normal. All they could do was to think and create and invent new ways to sin from bad to worse. That was the generation of Noah. The reason why the introduction described the 21st century is because the intention is to help us realize the sad, tragic state of the world that we are living in parallels the same state of Noah's world. The reason is usually, or the cause is usually, idolatry. Man commits many sins. Most of the sins that we commit, that we consider as most heinous, are usually related to fellow human beings. Like when we read in the papers of stepfathers abusing stepchildren, young children, we get very angry and upset. We live in a world that is so sick. The sins committed are so heinous and so disgusting that it is so difficult for us to imagine that we are supposed to be made in the image of God. And then the sins and the evil and the wickedness that we commit day in and day out throughout the whole world make us so ashamed. And to see how far we have all fallen to be made in God's image, the God who is good, holy, righteous, and just. And we who are made in that wonderful image are now behaving worse than beasts in the jungle. And so this introduction is basically to help us grasp 
the same state and condition that even in such an evil world, the eyes of the Lord in salvation is still very much alive. And just as the Lord saved Noah, he can save, he can save any sinner today. No matter how deep the world is in sin, no matter how dark the spiritual blindness and deadness is in the hearts of men, the greatness of God's salvation, the all-merciful penetrating eyes of the Lord can pierce into the darkest soul to save. This is the goodness, the greatness, and the mercies of God. Our world is in a very sad state because of the sin of idolatry. And this was also the case in Noah's world. Now, it is not so much the actual idols such as Baal and Ashtaroth that we read of in the books of Kings. But you and I know that idols are more than just figurines that are made by the hands of men using wood, stone, or some precious metal. When man does what is right in his own eyes, he will see himself as God. He will see himself as an idol because I just do what is right in my own eyes. That is idolatry. And that was exactly what we saw in the case of Cain. Remember when God rejected Cain and his offering? God said, I rejected Cain and his offering both. What was the problem with Cain? Cain just offered an offering that was good enough for Cain. And if it is good enough for Cain, it must be good enough for God. And so basically, he did what was right in his own eyes. And so he became his own idol. And we know that idolatry includes everyone who do not, everyone who does not bow down and worship the one living and true God. And so atheists who are very much like Cain, they will do what is right in their own eyes. They may say that, well, I'm atheist. I don't believe in God or any God. Well, you see yourself as God because you do what is right in your own eyes. And that is idolatry and the fruits of idolatry will be found everywhere. No difference whether it is in Noah's time before the flood or after the flood in our time. The fruits of idolatry have been clearly delineated for us by God in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 32. I'd like to read them to you for context, to help us realize and understand that what we see in our world was exactly what the Lord had already warned us of the fruits of idolatry. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now these are idol worshippers who do not want to acknowledge the one living and true God, and they would include atheists. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things, right? Like unto corruptible men, men included. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, right? So you see, the fruits of idolatry are clearly laid out for us from verse 24 of Romans chapter 1. And the first on the list is homosexuality, who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use to, into that which is against the nature. And likewise, also the men, living the natural use of the woman, burned in, them, in their lust one toward another, man with man, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What are they? Well, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, 
wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. That means parent does not know how to love children. That's what it means by no natural affection. These are supposed to be part of nature. Parents are supposed to just simply love and protect and look after and feed their children. You don't have to be a believer to do that. And yet, when you bow down to idols, that will be lost. Implacable, unteachable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Isn't that what we see in our world today? They have pleasure in what they are doing. And you and I know that the sin of idolatry doesn't die with that generation of idolaters. It will plague following generations. As the Bible warns us in Exodus 20 verses 4 to 6, which basically refers to commandments of God. The Ten Commandments. This is commandment Number two, when you bow down to idols, it is a very superstitious transgression. And then you will teach it to your children to pray to the dead. That's you, after you are gone. And so they loved you, and they want to honor you before you die. You make them this promise, as it were, and so they feel compelled. So long after you are gone, they will continue to bow down to you. And then they in turn will teach it to their sons and so on. And so it will not just simply die off with your death. It will snare future generations. And then this will spread from one family to an entire city, to an entire tribe, and it can even plague an entire nation and the whole world. And this is the result. And this is our world. And so the eyes of the Lord in salvation in this world of sin and evil like ours was exactly what the Lord saw in Noah's world as well. Look at verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 6. World in condemnation, God sees. The 21st century world and Noah's world, what a sad, sad state. In Noah's time, the people lived eight, nine hundred years. If you were to tabulate the ages described for us in Genesis 5, you will find that when Adam died, he was a great, 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 great grandfather. That means he survived all the way right up to the father of Noah. That means he was alive to see the birth of Lamech, who was Noah's father. He was not around to see the birth of Noah. But he was around to see the birth of Lamech, Noah's father. You just imagine, people live eight, nine hundred years. In other words, God slowed down the aging process of the people in Noah's time, just as he will slow down the aging process of the people during the millennium. Because the Lord said the people who enter the millennium in this mortal flesh and the people who are born in the millennium, they will live and grow like trees. Trees do not stop growing. That means they're going to live on and on and on and on and on. In other words, during the millennium, the Lord will provide man a new heaven and a new earth that will be like the earth prior to the global flood. Now just imagine eight, nine hundred years, how many children you can have and how the world will continue to increase in numbers. Now, our teacher in America told us that Conservatively speaking, there could be as many as a billion people when the flood began. 
from Adam right up to the flood, if you were to do your mathematical calculation, it will be 1,656 years. And the people lived 8-900 years. If you are a thief and you live 8-900 years, can you imagine how good a thief that person would be? If you are a murderer, if you are an evil person, whatever evil that you commit with hundreds of years of practice, of repeated criminal activities. You just imagine how good and how deadly you are if you are a murderer. If you have the same kind of power like that of Hitler and Mao, they had absolute power in their heyday. And they were permitted to live eight, nine hundred years. Just imagine the kind of damage they can do to God's world, to the people under them. And you're going to be given a glimpse regarding the kind of power that the generation of Noah possessed. The Bible tells us they just simply multiply and increase and the daughters were born unto them, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, the identity of the phrase, sons of God. Now, of course, you cannot do a word study. You have to do a phrase study. You cannot do a word study on sons, and then another word study on God. There will be thousands of occurrences of the word sons. You have to do a phrase study. And so when you do a phrase study, you will realize that this phrase appears a number of times in the New Testament. But in the New Testament, whenever that phrase occurs a total of six times, it always refers to Christians, God's children, right? Sons of God in the New Testament. But this is the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, this phrase, sons of God, uh, appears only three times. And all three times, it's found in the book of Job. It's in your notes, page two in the middle. All right, if you look at them, you'll find that all three of them refers to angelic beings. Job 38 verse seven describes good angels only. Job 1 verse chapter one verse six and chapter two verse one describe angelic beings, both good and bad. They had to report to God. And therefore, based upon this usage, this occurrence, the sons of God here would have to be the fallen angels. And so the fallen angels possess men. And they saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. That's the word fair. And then they took them wives of all which they chose. In other words, you have husbands who are demon-possessed. Now, when you look at the Gospels, you will find that a person who is demon-possessed is not always like the man who had a legion of demon, demons inside of him, where he had to live in the tombs, where they bound him with chains and he had supernatural strength to break the chains. Some of them can be very normal looking. Like in the book of Acts, there's the record of this little girl who was demon possessed and she had the ability to tell the future. And her masters made use of her to tell the future. And so she was just a tool to the masters, to her masters. And then when the apostle Paul was there ministering the word of God, she became a problem. Because everywhere Paul went, she kept on saying that Paul was a servant of God sent by the Lord and he is there to preach God's word and so on. Everything that the girl said was true. But because her source was the devil, giving credibility, telling the truth about Paul, the danger was people might think that the source of the apostle Paul's ministry was also from the devil because of the girl's commendation of the Apostle Paul's ministry. And this was a dangerous 
problem because God had nothing to do with Belial. No fellowship, zero. And what she was doing was bringing confusion. And so Paul cast the demon out of the girl. Just because people are normal doesn't mean that they cannot be people who are possessed by demons. When you are demon-possessed, and then you get married, and then you have children, and children who are brought up by these demon-possessed individuals, and they live eight, nine hundred years, and their children will grow up, and then their children will have their own children, and so on. You just imagine what kind of world, what kind of society it will be like when you have fathers who are demon-possessed. What kind of children will they become? Do you think they're going to have the fear of God in their hearts? Obviously not. You have parents who are thieves today. You have parents who are liars. You have parents who are drug addicts. You have parents who are prostitutes. You have parents who are drunkards. You have parents who will commit all kinds of criminal activities, all kinds of evil and wickedness. And then you have the children living under the same roof with this kind of influence since birth. What do you think will be the impact on these children who will observe their parents' criminal, evil, wicked activities? They're going to imitate. They're going to become like them, obviously. And don't forget, they live eight, nine hundred years. Now, this was the world that was in condemnation, very similar to our world today. The Bible tells us that the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he will use the world's seductive attraction to do it. He will use man's lust as man's weakness to do it as well the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, sexual transgressions, greed, a love for money and the luxurious lifestyle, all these, including the pride of life, where man will be so deep and steep in sin and in his self that he will not want to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which requires the fear of God the mourning for sin, that means they have to humble themselves and they refuse. And that's why the Bible warns us of the deadly nature of idolatry and how it will plague the world and the world will be snared. And that is our world today, just like in the days of Noah. And the Bible says, God knows, because God himself tells us in verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. How long do you think I should continue to have this contention with sinful men? Expecting, desiring, demanding even holiness from them. And men kept on turning their backs, generation of the generation of the generation on God's goodness and grace. We are living in his world. We are made by him. And he had every right to take us to task. And we turn this beautiful earth that God has created into a cesspool of evil and wickedness and the stench of sin. Like smelly savor ascended from earth to heaven. How can we expect God to do nothing? And so the Lord said, I will not always strive with man. Why? Because he is flesh. What does it mean because he is flesh? It means that man is, number one, mortal. He can die. He is flesh. Number two, because man is flesh. He depends upon the things of this earth for survival. And if God were to afflict this earth 
man would suffer and man would even die because you are flesh. Number three, man must realize because of his mortality how frail and how weak he is and yet he fills himself with arrogance, thinking that he is indestructible and invincible, thinking that man's spirit can conquer and overcome every adversity on earth and there is absolutely nothing, not even space, can he not conquer? They want to penetrate into the beyond, thinking that they are so great and so smart, not realizing that they are just simply made of flesh. That's what God meant when he made this simple declaration for that he also is flesh. Does he not know that? Does he not realize his own weakness and mortality? Why would he want to be so proud and so arrogant and so full of himself? And so the Lord said, his day shall be 120 years. That means from this point of his declaration in Genesis 6 verse 3, man will now be given only 120 years to live. That's it. Now, this 120 years is with reference to the period of time before the global flood begins. That's all. It does not refer to Moses preaching. There is no mention of Moses preaching when this 120 years are mentioned. It just simply tells us that man is under God's judgment. He is flesh. He can die. And all God needs to do is to afflict the earth and man will experience and they should realize their own mortality, how frail he is. And with this frailty and with this knowledge, hopefully, he will humble himself instead of being so arrogant and raising his fist against God. That's God's intent throughout the scriptures. Whenever you see all these so-called natural disasters, they are sent by God, allowed by God, permitted by God to remind man that he is flesh. He doesn't have to be proud and arrogant the way that he is just because he's able to accomplish in his own eyes what he thinks is so great and so mighty, able to design and build the bullet trains, they call them, to fly into the outer space with their gadgets. Man thinks that he's so great that he can plunge into the deepest ocean with their vessels. And they can fly in the speed of sound faster than any bird that God can create. He thinks he's so clever. Well, the Lord wants to remind man that you are nothing but flesh. The moment you die, you realize that you are now nothing. But by then, you die in your sin, you end up in hell. Do you not know that? In other words, you are walking on very thin ice. And God wants mankind to know that. Hopefully, they will do something about their own frailty and mortality. And that's why the Lord will send Noah to preach the word of God. And we will look at that as we continue with the next passage. Verses 1 and 2, world in condemnation, parallel our world. A world under judgment, especially men, also parallels our world. And God had given them 120 years. From today's perspective, I do not believe that God will give to man another 120 years before he destroys it by fire. We may not even have a hundred, not even 20, perhaps not even 10. We do not know how many years left we have before the rapture. But the moment the rapture takes place, the earth will have only seven more years left, which God described as a period of great tri tribulation. It will be a very, very dark, dark time during the final seven years of man's existence on this earth before God destroys it. 
Well, in Noah's time, God said 120 years. Why the delay? Very often we see in other passages of the Bible what God shared with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. When the sins of the Canaanites are full, they will be judged. When were they full in the eyes of God? When God sent Joshua and the two million plus Israelites to conquer the land of Canaan, which was also known as the promised land. That's when their sins were full. Now, this is God's way of dealing with sinful men. He will be patient. He will exercise long-suffering and allow man to sin repeatedly, generation of the generation of the generation. In the midst of all these, he will have his servants, always have his remnant, keep on preaching the gospel of hope of Jesus Christ to save as many individuals as possible. That has always been God's way. God will never, never allow a world that is in judgment to remain in judgment without hope, without the gospel of salvation to save them. And so, when the sins of mankind are full, now, you want to know what kind of sins they were? Look at verse 4 and verse 5. There were giants. Now, the word giants there means people who are bullies. That's what it means. It comes from the root word to fall. People who make others fall. So they are called giants. They are big. I mean, bullies are big. Now, the word giants can be literal, literal in the sense that if you're the size of Goliath, nigh over plus feet, you can bully any human being, basically. Right? Because of your size, and Goliath was a trained soldier all his life. I'm sure he had never lost a single battle all his life. Even as a child when he was growing up, he must be huge. And that's why when David appeared, he was so angry. He felt so insulted. After all my battles, I've killed so many people throughout my military life. And I challenge your champion, and your champion is nothing but a child, a young lad, a boy. Are you joking with me? He was probably very, very insulted. But that was also perhaps the one and only battle that he lost, which cost him his life. There were giants. Bullies. And we know that the Anakims, they were giants. They were big. They were huge. Right? It could be literal, but it could be figurative. It basically means bullets. There were giants in the earth in those days. All right? Bullies. People with power. I mean, you can say that there are also giants in our time. Maybe you would include the 20, 50 richest men on earth, and probably they're all billionaires. Well, you may call them giants, but they are not very tall in terms of height, but they're giants in terms of their wealth. All right, richest people on earth, giants. But remember, these very, very rich billionaires, they wield a lot of power, a lot of influence over their companies, and I'm sure in their businesses and their companies, they will hire thousands of employees and these thousands of employees will have their own families, which will add to that number. And so if they were to close down some of their companies, you just know how many people, thousands of people will lose their jobs. And then many families will now have to suffer hunger. They can't pay for their houses. They can't pay for so many items that they have bought based upon higher purchase on loan, thinking that their jobs will continue on and on and on and on, and their monthly income will be enough to pay the bank or pay the creditors, whatever that they borrowed 
to buy all these large items in advance, promise to pay with interest, of course, on a monthly basis. And the moment they lose their jobs, many families will be in trouble. They could even lose their homes. And many have lost their homes. And therefore, they are very powerful people. So they are giants, they are bullies in the earth in those days. And also after that, and similar to that, you add on to all these, you have the sons of God that will be men who are possessed by demons. They came in unto the daughters of men and they bore children to them. And the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And the word renown basically is where we get the name Shem. Shem means name. People who are very well-known, very famous, or rather infamous. In other words, these were mighty men. Mighty men in what form? Mighty men means what? Mighty in battle. Mighty in killing. Mighty in controlling. So verses 4 and 5, they are linked. And so now you have a world of powerful individuals. Remember a world that could probably be a billion people. And then you have so many powerful people controlling millions of other people. Now, what kind of world it was like before the flood? We have absolutely no idea as far as the topography was concerned. Other than what God described for us in Genesis 1 and 2, that world. That was Noah's world before the flood. There was the Garden of Eden, of course, but nobody could get in because there would be the flaming swords of the angels that the Lord had placed there to stop everyone or anyone from getting in. They must never be allowed to eat the fruit of the tree of life, for to eat it means that they are beyond salvation. They cannot be saved. Whatever state and condition that they're in, eating the fruit of life, they're going to be in with eternity. And so since they're all in sin, they are not permitted to eat it. Then they cannot be saved anymore. And the Lord will not want that to happen to any sinner. And so God said, I saw the wickedness of man was great. And so these mighty men were not hunters of animals. These were mighty men who are probably hunters of other men. They bully, they kill. They will do whatever they want in order to make themselves more powerful, richer and richer and richer, very similar to our world today. Isn't that the same? These multi-billionaires, you and I know that when you look at their age, they are not in their 20s. Even if they are in their 30s and some of them are in their early 40s, with their hundreds of billions of dollars, they don't even need to work for the rest of their lives. And if they are in their early 40s, you give them another 40, 50 years to live, they can very well maintain their present lifestyle of a billionaire all the days of their lives until they die. They will still have enough billions left over. And yet they still want more. It's not enough. They want to add to that number. They are already the top 10 richest people on earth, according to Forbes. But it is still not enough. They have all the things of the world that their heart could ever desire, but they want some more. This is the craving and the way of man. And don't forget, like every empire of old, when they rise to the top, what do you think will be at the bottom as their staircase for them to rise to the top? Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives would have been killed and massacred for them to expand the borders of their kingdom and empires. You can't imagine how many tens of thousands the Babylonians slaughtered. Likewise, the Middle Persians who succeeded them, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then the British Empire. And then we have all the world wars and what nations that we see today are the superpowers. Can you imagine the kind of people 
that they have to kill in order for them to hold on to their power. We talk about the Great Wall of China. How many hundreds of thousands of people must have been killed in the construction of that Great Wall of China, which is known as one of the wonders of the modern world, one of the eight wonders, ten wonders of the modern world, or the seven wonders, the last and final man-made construction to be seen from a satellite. If you are flying up above the earth, as you go higher and higher and higher, it is said that the last and final man-made object will be the Great Wall of China, as if it is a great thing. It is a great thing in terms of its engineering, in terms of its architectural construction and all the rest. But at what cost? How many sons and fathers and brothers have died throughout the centuries when that gigantic so-called Great Wall was built. Worth it just to have this Great Wall as some kind of what? Man's greatness, great engineering skill. All those big buildings like the pyramid and so on, structures. Lives have been lost in order to boost man's ego and greatness. But the Lord says, I know when I will judge and destroy. He saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The eyes of the Lord in salvation the eyes of the Lord saw the wickedness of man, just as God's eyes see the wickedness of man today, including every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. The Lord saw them. And God's conclusion, judgment, only evil continually. Is it any different today? No. The penetrating eyes of the Lord in our sinful world. The Lord tells us every single soul. The Lord's revelation is I know what is in your heart. I know what you are thinking. Even though you may not have expressed it, even though you may be in your hideout in the early hours of the morning, lying in bed and devising new ways, new cruelties. The Lord says, I see them all. And I know them. Are you not afraid? You dare to toy with all these sinful cruelties, evil and wickedness? over and over and over and over again. That's the word continually. There may be pauses in between, but then it will come back. And then pauses, and then it will return repeatedly. And that's what sinful man did in the time of Noah. And God said, this generation, you will have only 120 years more. And that would be it. We must take note in the 21st century. We are living in such a world. The world needs to be warned and the world needs to know that the all-seeing seeing eyes of God are not limited to only the minds and the heart of his children. But his penetrating, omniscient, omnipresent sight can look deep into the innermost recesses of sinful man's heart. They might not acknowledge him as their creator. They definitely will not bow down to him in humility and accept Christ as Lord and as Savior. 
But that does not in any way diminishes the power of God in penetrating into their innermost thoughts. And every single devices and evil that they think of committing, think of committing, they might not even have committed them. The thought of it alone, all their plotting and planning, that may have taken them ages. The Lord says, I saw them. I know them. You think of men like Haman who wanted to slaughter all the Israelites within the vast Persian empire that was at that point in time made up of 127 provinces. It's huge. And if he had succeeded, you would probably conclude, and you are probably not wrong, that every Jew would be killed which means the line of the Messiah would have been severed permanently and God would fail in keeping his promise that the Messiah will surely come from the Davidic line. You think the Lord did not know about Haman's evil? Haman was a very, very powerful man at the time. He was very capable and he kept on getting promoted after promotion after promotion by King Ahasuerus. And he thought that he was untouchable. And so he hated Mordecai, hated him so much that every Jew or rather Israelite must be killed because of his hatred for Mordecai. He plotted and he planned it before he deceived the king of Persia into passing a law that on one particular day, nearly a year from the time of the signing of the decree, that every Jew will die and every non-Jew will be given the authority from the king of Persia to slaughter them and not a single Jew was permitted to raise up arms to defend himself because to do so would be treasonous. The might of the whole Persian army will fall upon you if you were to resist and defend yourself. And Haman managed to get that passed. And of course, he was extremely delighted because of his evil heart. Did the Lord see all these things that he was doing behind the backs of the king? Sure. The king was ignorant. Many people were ignorant, but God was not. God saw. And of course, Haman was the one who got hanged. The same gallow that he built to hang Mordecai, God turned it around and he himself was hanged on that gallow. The greatness of God. Sinful men must take heed and take note that the Lord saw and he continues to see into the very heart of every single human being. And you and I know that this heart of every single human being, including their thoughts, they kept on changing because our mind never stopped thinking. We keep on thinking, keep on adding new memories and new knowledge. And every time we keep on thinking and thinking and thinking, and no matter how many people, a billion or in our context, more than 7 billion people, every single human being, every moment of every thought, the Lord says, I know them all. I know them all. I see them all. The moment you think of the next evil, I see them. The next evil, I see them. The next evil, I see them. The Lord sees them all. And the amazing thing is all at the same time. The Lord is not limited by time zone. He sees them. We better be afraid. If you are not a child of God, you have not truly accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and the Savior who died on the cross for your sins because he is the only way that can save you from the wrath of God because we are all sinners. We are all idol worshippers. If not idol made of stone and wood and precious metal or precious items, even atheists, they are idolaters. And that is a great sin against God, directly. 
And the Lord knows, and you better know that he knows. And if you continue on in this evil, sinful way, thinking that nobody can seize your mind and know what you're thinking, you better think again. The Lord sees everything, every single bit of it, every second of it. And perhaps you need to know, even before you think it, the Lord knows it. That's how great God is, because he knows and sees all things all at the same time. He is not bound by time. He begins time. Time began when God first said, I created the heavens and the earth. That's when the time begins. Time for us. Before that, God already existed before time. So he is not bound by time. He's not limited in any way by time or space or anything like man. And so we have to realize and be afraid because God sees everything. And once, the moment our sins are up, judgment will come. Judgment will come. And when the sins of the world are full, judgment will come. Just like in the time of Noah, it will also be true in our time. God has given to us enough clues to give us a warning of the nearness of his return. We don't need God to tell us 120 years, as it were. God already warns us the final seven years, which Jesus described it as great tribulation. And before the rapture, the world will continue to get from bad to worse, to worse, to worse. The Lord tells us, and many of the signs prior to his return are already fulfilled, such as the birth of the charismatic movement in 1906. That is a sign, and that's fulfilled. It's already here. Jesus prophesied that 2,000 years ago in Matthew 24. 24. Great signs and wonders, false Christ and false prophets will arise performing great signs and wonders. The word great there is mega, mega signs and wonders. And that's exactly what we see in the charismatic move, movement. It's a precise, exact fulfillment of God's prophecy of one of the signs prior to Christ's return. And now we see we are living in it. So when you read those passages in the Bible pertaining to the signs of Christ's return, very, very carefully, Make sure you know which one are already past tense, not future tense. Just like if you were living in the time of Jesus and you read Isaiah 7, 14, that was one of the signs prior to the first coming of Christ. He will be born of the Virgin Mary. And when he is really born and he is already living with his parents in Nazareth and you read Isaiah 7, 14, don't think that it is future tense. That's past tense. The gospel will cover the face of the earth. It will be all over the world. And it is true. Isn't that past tense also? And these are the signs that the Lord gave 2,000 years ago when it was first given. I'm sure the disciples must have thought that it was impossible. How could the gospel be all over the world? Don't you know how big the world is, Lord? And now in our time, 2,000 years later, it has really traveled around the world many times over with technology, with modern communication methods. The moment the sins of the world are full, judgment will come. And then in the midst of all these, the Bible tells us, the Lord showed mercy. Verse 6, He repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now the word repent must not be understood in the same way when it is applied to sinful men like ourselves. In our context, it is because we have sinned against God and we need to repent. We need to change. We need to turn around. In the case of God, when this word is used, it simply means the Lord sighed strongly. The Lord is brokenhearted. The Lord is saddened. That's what it means by the word repented. It repented the Lord. It 
broke the Lord's heart. That sinful man made in his image once upon a time, it was concluded by God as very good. But now look at mankind a thousand six hundred years later after the fall of man. It grieved him at his heart. You see, that's what it means. His heart was saddened. His heart was broken. He was weeping. And then the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. Remember, the sea creatures are excluded, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Because of man's transgressions, and how man continued to devise more and more evil in his heart continually. The Lord said, in order to save man, I have to destroy man. Because the messianic line was at stake. If there were a billion people, how many people entered the ark? Eight. Imagine that, only eight souls. And then the Lord said, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What does it mean? Now we know that grace means Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Was that the same grace that Noah believed in, that the Lord saw in Noah? Because the Lord's conclusion was the Lord found grace. The Lord did not find grace in others, but he found it in Noah. Now, my proposal to you is Noah started preaching at the age of 500. That's why the age of 500 was mentioned in Genesis 5 verse 32. Noah was 500 years old. And then the Bible tells us that he was 600 years old when the first drop of rain fell from the sky to give us an idea of how long he preached and how long it took him to construct the ark. Found grace. Now, salvation in Christ Jesus is the grace. Faith is basically the hand that reaches out to take the grace. So by faith, we receive the grace of God that saves us. Now, when you look back into the early chapters of Genesis, you will find that the moment Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do other than to punish them? God dressed up Adam and Eve's nakedness with the skin of animals. That means God killed the animals who give the skin of the animals to cover their nakedness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And then when we came to the two brothers, Cain and Abel, Abel offered a blood sacrifice according to God's teaching, according to what he has learned from Papa and Mama, probably Adam and Eve. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. All right, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. In other words, God accepted him and his offering because he did exactly as what he has been told, unlike his brother Cain, who had also been taught what Adam and Eve do, that without the Shedding of blood, that is no remission of sin. You cannot approach God without a blood sacrifice. Adam, by faith, he obeyed. And by his action and by the clean animal that he offered, God accepted him and his offering. In the case of Cain, he was very sincere, but he did what was right in his own eyes. And in his own eyes, what is good enough for Cain must be good enough for God, even though it was not a blood sacrifice. It was the best of the fruit of his ground. And God rejected him, even though he was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong, and his sacrifice. Now, we know that faith means you believe in what God's word has taught you, and you obeyed it. 
And so when you look at Hebrews 11, 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So we have to assume that Adam and Eve had taught Abel and Cain and the children exactly what kind of offering they are to offer. That's God's word. Adam listened, he obeyed, God accepted. And that's why they are also saved by grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because these clean animal sacrifices, they were the type of Christ. They were what God used as a temporary representation of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world until Jesus actually came at his first coming. Before that, the clean animal sacrifices were used as a representation, as a substitute. Of course, the content, the details, the information of the gospel that Noah believed in is not the same as what we have today. We have a complete gospel because of progressive revelation. What was given at that point in time, in Noah's time, as long as Noah believed what was revealed to him at that point in time, it would be enough to save him. And then by the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, more information would be given. And so as long as they believe in that gospel in their time, with more information compared to Noah's time, they too would be saved. And when it comes to our time, it will definitely be considered the most amount of information. We know the city is called Bethlehem. We know so much more. And we have to believe every jot and tittle of it. The moment God revealed more, you believe only half, you will not be saved. You will have to believe all that God has revealed to you at your time when you are born, when you live. And in our time, it is the whole Bible. And so we have to believe every aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be saved. And we thank God for the gospel that saved. And so Noah believed, and the demonstration of the belief when God called him to build the ark. Faith must be seen by the evidence of works, actual obedience. If Noah said, I believe, but he doesn't build the ark, that's not true faith. The demonstration of the sincerity of his genuine faith is in the construction of the ark, and he did it exactly as God told him, and when it was time, he and his wife and his three sons and their wives entered the ark. How many joined him? Zero. How many people were there? A billion. Only eight souls believe. But the Lord saw the heart of evil men. And he saw the grace that was in Noah. And Noah was saved. Will God see grace in your heart, in your life? Because that is most important. And if he finds grace in you just as he found it in Noah, evidence it by a life that is lived in light of God's word. That's the key. Evidence it by a life that is lived in light of God's word. Don't go up to the highest building and shout, I believe. But if you don't obey the word of God, like how Noah obeyed the word of God in building the ark, telling them that rain will fall down from heaven, they must have laughed at him, they must have mocked him because they have never seen rain before. The Bible tells us in Genesis 2 that a mist will come up from the ground to water the earth at that time. And so for Noah to preach and warn them of the global flood, it must have been something that they must believe by faith. And so when Noah built this gigantic ark, they must have been laughing at him. But when the drop started to fall from heaven, Noah was really inside the ark. How many people banged the door and tried to get in? It was no use because the Lord was the one who closed the door and kept it shut. Not Noah, the Lord. And the last man to live in Genesis 5 was Methuselah. 
the year that Methuselah died was the year the flood began. The eyes of the Lord in salvation. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Will the Lord see grace in your life? Let us pray. Our gracious, merciful, loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for allowing us to be saved in Christ Jesus and live and serve and witness for the Lord in these last days. Very likely, the generation that lived during the return of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, O God, to be mindful of how great Thou art, for the eyes of the Lord continue to see through everything that happens on this earth. And most importantly, may the Lord see grace in the heart of all his children. Help each and every one of us, O Lord, to not take our salvation for granted, but to look deep into our own heart and to make sure that we are truly born again. And this is seen by our obedience to thy holy and precious word of life in the way that we live, in everything that we do, including our thoughts. For the Lord will see grace in us. For Jesus' sake, may thou help us and hear our cry that all of us will make sure of our salvation and experience the joy of salvation in Christ Jesus. For this we ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God for the faithful preaching of God's word. A very blessed new year to everyone. Um, the discussion, we're going to have uh, some discussion time right now. And the questions for the discussion in the, in the respective Zoom meeting IDs can be found on the last page of the notes. Do take note that it's a it's a new year. So the juniors, those who are each those who turn ten this year, are most welcome to join. If you have any questions during the discussion, please let your facilitator know, and we will pass them on to Reverend Quick. We'll answer them during the roundup. The roundups at seven p.m. Please return back to this same YouTube link for the roundup, and don't be late. Thank you.
Good evening. Welcome back to our summary. We are going to answer the discussion questions. I have not received any new question. Permit me to read the questions first, after which I shall answer the questions one by one. What is your perspective of the societal world that you are living in now? My perspective of our society is that it is climaxing toward a period of time similar to the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. In the case of Noah, as what we have studied, the mind and thinking of men was only evil continually. That was God's evaluation. That's what God saw. And that was what the Lord Jesus Christ prophesied will be the same prior to his return. And the Lord also compared it with Sodom. We know that Sodom's two most prominent transgressions were fornication and homosexuality. And we have seen fornication already being an accepted transgression that has lost its stigma. Those who live together without getting married feel no shame anymore. Not when it first started, people will still try to hide it because it was a very shameful thing if you were told that so-and-so are living together without getting married. But that is no longer the case. But worse than fornication is homosexuality. Because homosexuality, they are much more forceful. They see their sin as an alternate way of life. And they want to parallel that with the normal family life of one man and one woman, a father and a mother, a husband and a wife. And now they are forcing it down everyone else's throat. And if you do not accept them, you will be severely ostracized and even scathingly punished, either verbally or physically. This is the society that we are living in, which the Lord had already prophesied will be the case prior to Christ's return. And that's why many of us who are God's children, we see the soon return of Jesus Christ as very, very imminent. This is our society. It is evil, it is wicked, and it will only get worse. Is it friendly towards Christianity? It will be very friendly toward the Christianity that will turn apostate, that is, and the Christianity that has fallen away. In other words, it is the Christianity that will embrace the philosophies and ideas of the world it will be very friendly toward that version of apostate Christianity, but not true Christianity. In the case of true Christianity, the Bible is adamantly clear. Christ has no fellowship or concord in any manner with Belial, the nickname given by God to the serpent, to the devil, to Satan, same individual. And therefore, as Christians, as believers, we must also have no fellowship or concord with unbelievers, which the Bible describes as infidel unbelievers, those who do not want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. And therefore, it is not only unfriendly, we are at odds. We are at enmity. That's what the Lord tells us. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent will continue to be at enmity against one another. And therefore, if the world is friendly toward you, and if the world likes you, if the world pats you on the back, and you seek after the accolades of the world, you are in serious trouble. Because the Lord warns us, the love of the world, if it is in you, the love of God is not in you. You and I must choose. Do you see it as friendly toward you as an individual now? As an individual where we are, where we are witnessing and serving for the Lord, we thank God it is not a continuous 
time of great persecution and adversity. But we know that in our places of work, in our schools where we study, the moment you talk about Christ, you will find yourself most unpopular. But we thank God that there will be moments of peace as we can see this constantly throughout the Bible. Just like the life of the Apostle Paul, it was fraught with a lot of persecution. However, we also read of many moments, many days or weeks or even months and sometimes even a year or two where he could remain in one city and continue to minister the word of God with perhaps sporadic persecution here and there, but by and large, he experienced periods of peace where he could worship, study God's word, teach God's word, evangelize. So it will be a mixture of peace and adversity in the life of every believer. But the world must always be seen as a battleground, not a playground. It is not that the Lord saved us and allowed us to remain on earth and see this as a playground for us to play the fool. It is a place where we are to fight the good fight of faith, earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And because of these terminologies, it is obviously not too far-fetched to conclude that the world must be to every faithful child of God a battleground where you must defend your faithfulness and your holiness to the Lord Jesus Christ at all costs. Sometimes even against our own loved ones, as the Lord Jesus Christ warns us. If you love father, mother, brother, sister, even your own life, including your wife, more than Christ, you are not worthy to be the Lord's disciples. Number two, do you think God would describe the educational system of Singapore as every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually? Now note, I just change a phrase or a word here in the next few questions. First is the educational system, followed by the economic system, and then followed by the entertainment system. The educational system, of course, is varied from country to country. Now let us limit our answer to Singapore, which is what we are most familiar with. In the case of Singapore, when you study under the educational system of Singapore, you may find that it is very subtle in its negation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the presence of God, especially the teaching of evolution. The teaching of evolution is what we see in all our science books since our children are very young. They have already been taught that the world is billions of years old, and when they are told about this dinosaur or that dinosaur, it is taught as millions of years old. Dinosaurs and human beings do not coexist, even though in the Bible, it is clearly taught from day one, from Genesis chapters one and two, that they coexist. The beasts, which will be the dinosaurs inclusive in that sixth day, Man and the beasts were created on the same sixth day, sixth 24-hour day creation. And therefore, they do coexist. And you find that mentioned in the book of Job as well. And so therefore, the educational system, every imagination and the thoughts of those who study in the educational system, if you blindly accept evolution as the norm, as how this world came into existence, then your thinking, your evaluation will be every imagination of the thoughts because it is now colored by evolution. And so when you look at the world around you, it is the Big Bang Theory. God is completely erased from your mindset. And when God is completely erased from your mindset, every imagination that you think about will be very selfish and self-centered. The degree of evil may not land you in prison, but evil nevertheless in the eyes of God in terms of its immorality and in terms of its lack of godly ethics. So in that sense, 
it will be every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now remember the thoughts of his heart. All right, so the thinking and the motive. What about the economic system? Obviously, greed. That is the key. We are living in a world where the economic system is worse than at any time in human history, in my opinion. And it is because of the stocks and shares that is basically everywhere. Ubiquitous, they call it, right? Every nation survives on this concept of what we think this particular company that is now put up for people to invest in, buy some stocks and shares in that company, believing that this company will improve and grow exponentially, hopefully, and you're going to make tons of money out of it. And so basically, you are spending money in the present based upon your earnings in the future, what you think will be called earnings. And so when people buy shares, so this company actually physically, based upon its own hardware, what they actually own may be worth 50% or even less of what it's actually worth in terms of its shares and stocks. Because the shares and stocks in terms of its value is 10 years, 15 years down the road. But in the present, it is worth much less. And so people will pay big bucks to this company, directors or whoever the owners are. And so they're going to take your money and they're going to try to invest in the way that they invest in their company, hoping that it will grow at that particular rate that it is actually worth what you think it should work. Let's say, for example, this present, it's worth 100 million. Based upon the sale of the stocks and shares, people think that it is worth a billion. And so when you value the stocks and shares, it's $1 billion. But in reality, in hard money, concrete terms in, at the present, it's worth only $100 million. Then where do you get the billion? What people project into the future. And so whatever extra money they will invest. Now, what if the investment went bust? And you pay so much, and that company just simply kept on going down and down and down. And so you think that that company is worth so much, you pay so much money. And the moment the share prices drop, you can go bankrupt. And this is not linked to the rest of the world. If it's just simply your nation that is isolated from the rest of the world, the world's economy will not crumble. But you and I know that the whole world economy is intertwined so tightly, so intricately that it cannot uh, get themselves out of it. No country, not even America, definitely not America, not even China or any of these big countries can pull out now. The moment they get sucked into the World Trade Organization, they are there forever, for the long term, right up to the very end. Either they all die together or they all get rich together. Now, this is the economy of our world. Is it an economy where every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually? Yes, because everybody wants money. Everybody loves money, and it is the root of all evil. They are greedy, and they are getting greedier all the time because enough will never be enough. You look at our whole economic system, Every economy of the world must grow and grow and grow and grow. We call it because of inflation. If you don't grow faster than in inflation, there is no actual growth. And so you must grow. You are never contented with what you have this year and next year. If it's just exactly the same, no good, you must grow. And this growth pattern will one day cost the whole economy, in my opinion, of course, I'm no economist, to collapse. You cannot keep on living in the present based upon your future. That is, to me, logically illogical, impossible. You must live in the present based upon what you have in the present, not what you think you will have in the future. But that is how the world is now. 
more many people are living with that concept in mind, living in the present based upon what they think will be the wealth of the future tomorrow. That's why many people are in debt. So when you hold stocks and shares of this company or that company, you think that that is really the value? You and I know that's not the real value. And so many people hold on to it. They dare not sell it just in case they will lose money. Just in case if I sell it today for 10 bucks per share, what about tomorrow or the next year, it will go up to 20 bucks. Wow, I lose so much. And so they hold on to it, not realizing that it could also fall. And so they will always be in this state of flux because of greed. They are not contented. If you're happy that it is worth 10 bucks, you sell at 10, you may make maybe a dollar for every $10 of the shares that you have. But if you hold on to it, it may go up to $20. That's you earn $11. That's a lot of money. And so you hold on to it. Isn't that greed? Where is contentment? Where is satisfaction? And so because of this greed that is in people and you're driven by greed, the whole world is driven by greed. And if you are a Christian and you dabbled in this kind of manner of life, and if you are not careful, if you are careless, you can get dragged in and sucked in as well. So be very mindful and careful. It is also a system where every imagination, because the people who run it, they are minions of the devil. So beware and be warned. Number four, entertainment system, obviously. Now you and I know it's ruled and controlled by the moguls. They are unethical. They are definitely immoral. All they want is make money out of you. And what is the formula? Very simple. Anything that appeals to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will make money because that's what controlling every soul except born-again believers. And we are the minority. And so this majority of people who are controlled by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you have entertainment, whether it is casino, whether it is opening your bar where you sell liquor, all the movies that people watch produced by Bollywood and Hollywood and all these entertainment industries, just make sure that the central theme focuses on lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you will make money. And isn't that what we see today in almost every field of entertainment? And therefore, conclusion, is it not every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually? The last days are here and it's not going to go away. It will climax with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to stop it all, just as the Lord stopped it in Noah's time by sending the global flood. And he will do it again by the global destruction of fire. Last question. Do you think God would describe the economic, sorry, I beg your pardon, number five, when the eyes of the Lord evaluate your life today, will he find grace just as he found grace in Noah? Now, we know that in the New Testament, the Lord helped us a great deal in providing for us plenty of verses revealing to us the result or the evidence of someone who is truly born again. He must understand God's word and he must obey it. He must love God. He must love the things of God. He must love worship. He must love Christian fellowship. All these are the results of someone who is truly born again, who has found the grace of God, which is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Other evidences of someone who is truly born again in Christ is his unceasing prayer and his desire for all things spiritual and eternal. His hope is in the new heaven and new earth. He lives as a stranger and a sojourner passing through this earth on his way to heaven. Now, these 
are clear evidence that the Lord has given to us to help us know our own heart. And if the Lord sees all these evidence in your heart, you will know that the Lord will find grace in your heart, just as he found it in Noah. The eyes of the Lord, the penetrating, omniscient eyes of God Almighty will surely find grace in your heart. May this be our truly biblical state and condition because we cannot deceive him. He cannot be deceived at all. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, I beg your pardon. He found grace in Noah, but Genesis said Noah found grace in the Lord. Is there any difference? Right? That's the question. Noah found grace means Noah found salvation in the eyes of the Lord. So that means when the Lord sees Noah, that means the Lord sees grace in Noah. So in that sense, it is similar. No difference. Just that you found salvation in Christ Jesus. And so when the Lord look at your life, the Lord knows that you are truly born again because he sees in you, like he saw in Noah, that you have found grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the eyes of the Lord. So therefore, the Lord sees grace in you because you have found grace, salvation in Christ Jesus. So in that sense, no difference. Thank you for the question. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, help us, O oh Lord, to be true, to be sincere, to be honest before thee, especially at the start of this church Bible study and also the new year. Perchance, O oh Lord, 2022 might very well be the year of our Lord's return and all your children will be caught up into the heavenly realms. We pray, Lord, that all of us will be prepared because we have found grace, the salvific work of the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins rose from the dead for our justification, has been found in our heart, and you have seen it. Help us, O Lord, to know our own salvation by the evidence that you have revealed to us in thy holy scriptures, especially in the New Testament. We truly, O Lord, need your help as Gentile believers, living, serving, witnessing in a Gentile world that hates you, that hates Christians, help us, O oh Lord, to be discerning. Help us not to fall into the snare of the devil, but each and every one of us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, because the eyes of the Lord is in salvation, and he knows exactly who is and who is not a child of God. May we be true to ourselves and to make sure that we are truly sons and daughters of the Most High. For this we ask with thanksgiving and for thy glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, good night, and God bless.